Hello, thank you very much. Thanks for coming. How are we all in the tribe of public radio listeners? <laughs> and the tribe of uh, uh, book, book talk goers. Um, Amy, thanks for being here. Oh, it's great to be here. Thank you. Uh, the book, uh, Political Tribes. You know, I think of myself as not being tribal. Is that absurd? Yes. Okay. It, it Bring is, it on. Uh, it, is, it is absurd. Um, so, uh, humans are tribal, like our fellow primates. And it's all, there are all kinds of interesting reasons for why we are. Um, that doesn't mean that we can't overcome our tribalism, but we are hardwired to crave group membership. And there are all kinds of great studies, um, really interesting, um, that show... I was just telling Bill, one of them is... Um, uh, a bunch of researchers divided, showed a group of kids a bunch of dots on a projector. And then they divided the, student, the, the kids up between the, group, the kids who had underestimated the number of dots and the ones who had overestimated the number of dots. Not a really very important distinction, you would think. The kids instantly got super tribal. They just thought everybody on their side was better. I mean, it's hard to imagine, you know, I'm a dot overestimator. <laughs> uh, but... They, so people will just, along the flimsiest of lines, want to separate. Um, I, I wrote about, there, there's one, um, well, this one's a little scary. Uh, again, oh, good. yeah, well, this is, it, the, um, once you connect to a tribe, it, the effect, uh, once you connect to a group, the effect is almost like a drug. I mean, literally, neurologically. You uh, start to see everything through your group's lens. You... Um, will interpret facts to come out to support your side's views. And you will want to think that members of your side are better in every way. So this is uh, the red shirt, blue shirt um, example. Oh, yeah. They took a bunch of kids, large numbers, um, and assigned them to the red group or the blue group. And assigned them corresponding t-shirt colors. They then put these children in front of computer docs and showed them a bunch of pictures of other children either wearing a red shirt or a blue shirt. And they asked the children for their reactions. The results were stunning. Remember, these are just kids between the ages of four and eight, and even though they knew absolutely nothing about the children in the computer uh, pictures, they consistently said that they liked the children wearing their color better, they wanted to allocate more resources to people wearing their color, and they thought that people wearing their color were morally superior. Um, and they, they displayed unconscious bias. When told stories about the, the children in the red and the blue shirts, they consistently remembered all the good facts about the people wearing their color and all the bad facts about people wearing the opposite color. So it's a very innocuous example, but it shows how our inclination is just to, to, to behave this way and to have an other, like a, a them. Then Amy, how can it be that I, and I know other people like this, there is a tribe of people who believe that they're not tribal. That, right, that I, I am, I'm a listener. I am tolerant, I'm open-minded, I get, I've read, I've read books about um, social psychology, I, you know, I've, I've heard of tribalism, I overcome it purposely. I'm not saying I, I succeed every time, but you kind of write in your book about people, the tribe of people who don't think they're tribal. Yeah, and I would say I'm in this tribe too, and I'm guessing most people in this room, and I think this does have to do with the recent election, a lot of the most... Um, uh, many people who do not think that they belong to a tribe, um, I'm going do, um, and I'm thinking of people who think of themselves as very open, very multicultural, very cosmopolitan, right? Because being cosmopolitan seems to be the opposite of a tribe. I embrace the world. Um, uh, enlightenment values, right? The enlightenment was about so enlightened. over, yeah, so enlightened, yes. individualism, uh, equality. And what's interesting is that this tribe of people, um, it, it's actually a very exclusion, it's a, an exclusive and exclusionary tribe. Because to be this way, first of all, you probably have had to been lucky enough to travel a little. Uh, how do you get this cosmopolitan mindset? You've probably interacted with people of different races and backgrounds, something I favor. Um, probably you've had some significant education. 
so that you learn to do these things. So, and so it's if, yeah. privilege, but does that? But it's isn't it still less tribal? Aren't you I, one of those multicultural enlightened people? I actually think, in some ways, this is one of the most snobby. Um, and, uh, and intolerant tribes, and you don't know that you're being intolerant. You just, in fact, you so are disgusted by how morally low something else is, you don't even realize you're making a judgment. Mm. And it's aesthetic, too. I've noticed this. I mean, this is a beautiful city, and everyone dresses probably with natural fibers and natural. You know, um, and you, I bet a lot of you think that so many things are tacky. You know, uh, right. well, WWE, Worldwide Wrestling. Fake tans. Fake, fake huge, over, I mean, I bet we all have rather similar views. Um, and so that's all judgment. And that's all part of a cultural tribe, aesthetic tribe. And, um, you, you know, again, it's really interesting. We're all probably from different religions and backgrounds and stripes. But I bet if you took a poll, many people would have similar views about diet, um, dress. And I teach on a college campus. We all even have our own language, our own vocabulary. I am so well trained about what language not to use. Um, you know, I'm, I, I, it, it, the vocabulary is actually quite complicated. It changes all the time. You know, what's an example? Latinx. Yes. You know, uh, and and so, uh, in just various gender terms, and I work very hard, and I'm worried that I'm going to make a mistake. So, if you think about people in the middle of the country or who haven't had all this exposure to all these terms, you know. I think we often hear people and they're like, they sound so horrible, misogynist, racist, they just, how can they refer to people like that? But we have our own vocabulary too that we don't, we don't realize it's actually also quite privileged. But my tribe and I are so polite that we keep these judgments <laughs> to ourselves. So doesn't that make us less toxically tribal have than you the... Have than, you seen the some intolerant of the, ones, the bad people? I'm sure you guys have seen uh, some of the some of the quotes that have come out. Um, who was the the CEO? Did you see that one from the Sil Silicon Valley? Uh, it, she she was referring to why um, people um, in her we you know people who are tolerant and favor equality. Uh, don't want to go live in the heartland because we and her quote was because we don't want to go live in a blank hole filled with oh, yeah. racist, stupid bigots, you know. Um, yeah. So, I mean, that that is, uh, it's just The so, basket of deplorables, It's, it's, it's the will. same idea, it's the same idea that, um, that, that uh, yeah, it's, it's very hard to escape, to be totally, in fact, I'm not even sure that we want to be tolerant of everything, mm. right? I mean, I'm not sure this, is, I'm not saying that this is a bad thing, yeah. but I do think that we separate and we make judgments and the cues are both va and important things, values, um, but they're also aesthetic and cultural and, and language. Uh, I think it's, it's, uh, yeah. How many, what tribes are you in? Is it an endless list? We're all in an, like, do, what, what do you think of yourself as, as being? Well, I think that countries and societies are most healthy when you have a multiplicity of tribes that are um, cross-cutting, you know, um, and that was something that uh, America used to be, people used to say about us, that we had all these voluntary associations. So it's very healthy and non-polarizing if you can be, okay, I'm one of my tribes is I'm Democrat, but I'm also Catholic, I'm also Chinese American, I'm also American, I'm also a Seahawks fan, I'm also uh, a vegetarian, I, I mean all, and then you would ha meet somebody else that might have some of your overlap, and you know, I'm a Republican, but I'm a Muslim, but I'm a, also a Seahawks fan, and those, what's happening, I think, um, one problem that the studies show is that America's political parties and our, our divisions are getting more um, chunky and rigidified. So, for example, immigration. Just 20 years ago, Republicans and Democrats overlapped a lot on immigration views. There was a huge, if you had a Venn diagram, there's a huge section in the middle, and, and it was both, a lot of people had more, you know, subtle views. Right now, if you look at the polls, the Pew studies, it's like these two extreme positions. You know, either full-blown, you know, maximum immigration or none. And it's, so it, that's kind of not so, you know, so healthy. Are we learning that those tribal identifications are more fluid than we thought, though? For example, there was a time, I remember when the Republicans were all about how more upright moral character was indispensable <laughs> oh, in a politician. <laughs> this is not, you know, I, I'm not uh, 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 starting a fight, right? It's just, but, but uh, the deficit, you know, the Republicans were the, were the deficit hawks. Uh, free trade, 
Uh, that was a Republican. Yeah. So, so whether it's good or bad, I don't know. But, but, but maybe tribalism is well is flu more I, fluid. I, I, yes, and it's interesting. I've I could talk forever about this. Uh -huh. A couple points. First of all, I think the existing party alignments make no sense. Yes, I mean, you know. So it's so a it, weird mix of things. Oh, if you're a, all, yeah. if you're an A, you're these this list. If you're a B, you're this list. But even like ten years ago, it was always a strange um, combination. The Republicans included the neo conservative. The Hawks mm. and the evangelical. I mean, there were all these weird things. Yeah. But going back to the first thing you said, I actually think a tribal lens explains it very well. Um, what uh, what these what what studies about group identity show is that once you connect to a tribe, you um, well actually Dan Kahan, my colleague, has done these studies showing that people actually vote. Um, it's often less important what the actual policies are. Right. Once you've decided that you're a member of this tribe, you just kind of go with, with, with what that is. Um, you, you stick to it. And this is especially true of lower, of, of less advantaged people who have a very cynical view of who the heck is in Washington. Right? They see Democrats go in, Republicans go in, and nothing ever changes for them. So in a way, you know, we're focused on, oh my God, this policy and that. And for them, they, they don't like the establishment that people in Washington never do anything. So in a way, once they connect with the side, and you've, you've heard that, that a lot of people, despite being feeling quite unhappy about it, voted Republican because they always were a Republican, yeah. or voted Democrat because they always were. So, so, um, so I, we may be saying the same thing, but it's, it's strange, I know you're right, that wait, what happened to these fundamental principles that, were, that belonged to these parties? Um, and, uh, but I, I think that the, the, the stickiness of the identification is very consistent with the force of tribalism. I think you said something in the book, some version of that there is equal or equivalent tribalism today on the left and right. Is that, is, do I have you right? Yes, and I don't think that's a controversial statement because I think, again, I think that we're all tribal. Um, and so in the, here's the situation. For 200 years, for almost all of our history, America was dominated economically, politically, and culturally by a very overwhelmingly dominant white majority. Um, and that situation um, feels very stable. Uh, it is very stable, right? Because uh, For the majority. It's easier to be nice when you're, you're dominant. It, and not just that. You feel like there's no tribalism here. And that's because there's just one super big tribe imposing its will on everybody else. So other tribes are wiped out, they're silenced. So in some ways, what we're calling tribalism and these group identities that are popping up and fighting, I think in some ways is a healthy reckoning. Like finally, many voices that were previously suppressed are, are, are being allowed to express themselves. Mm -hmm. But yes, what I also say is that for the first time in our history, we are seeing um, a, a degree of explicit group conscious identity politics on both sides. Now, if you define identity politics as social movements based on groups, we've always had identity politics. I mean, yeah. Jim Crow was identity politics. The suffragette movement was identity politics. But I do think that we're seeing something a little bit different now. And one of the reasons is because of the massive um, demographic changes that we are experiencing. Um, I had said that for most of our country, we were overwhelmingly a, a white nation with, with the meaning of white always a moving target. I mean, some, many Jews and Poles and Italians were originally not considered fully white, but, but that was the basic dynamic. But in the last 30 years, with um, massive immigration flows and a change in where those immigrants are coming from, for most of our history, they came from Europe. In recent decades, they came, like my own parents, from uh, Asia, Latin America, Africa, and developing countries. Because of that, we are now, um, uh, whites are now on the verge of losing their majority status at the national level. The prediction is, I think, by 2044, whites will no longer be a majority in this country. So the result is, when you have one group that's comfortably dominant, you can, all kinds of invidious things can happen, slavery and oppression. But yes, there's also a little room for generosity. That was the, the you're, you're right about the, the nice half of that it's easier to have this noblesse oblige yeah. when, by the way, you're also, your boot is also on somebody's throat and you're dominant. Yes, yes. 
But now we're in, not in that situation. We are now in a situation where every group in America feels threatened, not just minorities, but whites feel threatened. And there are these statistics in my book that I, I, I had to go back and check myself. I just didn't believe these studies. 67% um, uh, of working class whites believe that they, working class whites, believe that they suffer more discrimination than minorities. Um, and half of whites in general believe that. Um, so you, you can see what, what I'm saying. Um, today, not just um, minority religions like Muslims and Jews feel threatened, Christians feel threatened. It, it's a very part of their political rhetoric, you can hear it. Um, with Donald Trump in the office, women feel very threatened, but with the Me Too movement, men feel threatened. Um, straights and gays feel threatened, Asians, Latinos, everybody feels threatened. And everybody, uh, each group views the other group's claims of being persecuted as ridiculous, but that's exactly the hallmark of political tribalism. Um, and because of this, it's when groups feel threatened that they, they become more insular and defensive and less generous. They close ranks and they become more tribal. And that's one of the reasons that we're seeing much more explicit identity politics. I mean, you know, for the first time we have there's always been white nationalism, right? But it was always taboo, underground, KKK. Now we have open, it's shocking, openly white nationalist movements holding conferences that are, that are covered, you know, by, by the Atlantic. Um, and on the other side too, we have an ever dividing number of identities that are saying um, uh, uh, inclusivity used to be the watchword for the left. Um, uh, during the civil rights movement, a lot of it was the it was group transcending ideals. People were saying, "Let's go to a time when skin color doesn't matter." A lot of the lefties were, um, "Let's try to transcend not just race but ethnic, gender, even national borders, international human rights." This was a big thing. President Obama, when he said, "There's no black America, white America," we are not in that stage right now. Um, and, and I understand why. As somebody, I said I was very tribal. Um, I get it. What I trace in the book is that the reason that there was this turn is, for example, in Reagan era, a lot of progressives started to realize, you know, this group blind rhetoric, the supposedly no group identity, um, this universalist stuff, is actually uh, just seems to be a way for conservatives to oppose affirmative action to oppose policies that are supposed to correct racial inequity. So people started saying, you know, I'm not, we're not getting enough progress with this group blind stuff. Um, and, and thus was born in the late 80s and 90s what we now call identity politics. Really um, recognize me as a woman, as, as this gender, as this, um, uh, you know, recognition that a Latina woman's experience is very different from an Asian woman's experience, is very different from a, a, a white woman's experience. And, and so today on college campuses, uh, I know we're, we're on one and I teach on one, um, group blindness is the ultimate sin. I mean, that's, that's it's really, uh, it's, it's a, if you're trying to be group blind, it's, a, it's viewed as a way to erase the um, very distinctive um, uh, experiences of oppression that different groups have. So, so I understand why we're here, you know, so I don't, in fact, the whole book is about not finger pointing. And I, I, no matter what, everywhere I go, and I'm sure I'll, I'll, I'll be, I'm excited to hear from you guys too, but people are, but isn't it really all the other side's fault? Um, and I'm just interested in kind of diagnosing the problem, why we're at this moment of such rancor in this country. And the real danger, because again, I, we'll get to this, but the book actually tries to see not just America as America, but through this stepping back as part of a larger global pattern. And I'm not just talking about the far right movements in Europe. We have a lot in common. America today is starting to display destructive political dynamics that historically were more associated with developing countries. Countries that we thought, oh my God, we're nothing like Venezuela or Libya, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but we are starting to demonstrate, see some of these. And once you realize how high the stakes are, I mean, Libya fell apart. Uh, you know, it, it just, it, it, it was a, it was a multi-ethnic country like us, but its overarching Libyan identity 
was not strong enough to hold the country together. We thought they were going to come together as Libyans. We said, yeah, Professor yeah. President Obama said that. It's yeah. now time for the Libyans. Let, again, let's have some elections. We, we tend to romanticize elections. Yeah. But we are approaching a point where I think many of us view people who voted for the other side, not just as people that we disagree with and want to argue with, but, but literally as immoral, evil, you know, enemies. And, and that's a really dangerous situation. Yeah, um, I guess my question is, in addition to all of the natural tribalism that you're talking about and the various economic and other factors that are sort of have put us where we are today, to what extent do you feel like um, we're also where we are today in terms of the extreme rancor um, because we've been manipulated to some extent by the media in some cases maybe or um, you, know, uh, you know heads of large corporations or whatever to sort of because it's to their advantage to have us fighting each other mm. you know rather than mobilizing to make more significant changes in our society. Yeah, our tribalism manipulated. Well, it's, it's a great question. In fact, I, I completely agree with that. I, in fact, I would sort of invert it, which is we are so vulnerable to manipulation because we're so tribal. You know, why, if, to the extent, whatever the Russians did, why were, were why did, why did it work? Because they actually took stuff that was already out there and then, I mean, we, we respond to it. Um, um, again, to, you know, there's an interesting chapter where I compare the United States to Venezuela, um, and it's weird, the parallels, except for the racial polarity is the opposite. But um, again, demagogues, uh, because people are so tribal, and, and um, this is scary, but we experience pleasure from sticking it to the other side. You know, we, we actually, our levels of you know, signals go off when we um, are, we see uh, the, the people that we don't like suffering almost, you know. Um, so we are very susceptible to demagogues, to race mongers, to hate mongers, um, social media, cable news, um, it obviously contributed. But I guess my point is why is it so effective, right? It, it, it's, it's such an easy play um, and it's, Again, we don't like to think of ourselves as similar to Iraq in any way, but Sunnis and Shias got to get along together for years in, in many countries. I mean, you, you can't physically tell them apart. And yet, when the demagogues, politicians, vote-seeking, opportunistic, power-hungry people come in, they realize, you know, the best way to inflame people, get people mad, and vote for me is not by proposing a moderate, compromise, rational policy, but by saying they are stealing the country, they are exploiting you, they are whatever, they are taking your money, taking your jobs, taking whatever, and it's a, it's a shortcut and it repeatedly works and it, it actually is what populism is, it, it is what um, scapegoating, why it's so effective. Amy, can tribalism be manipulated or uh, used for good? Yes, um, weirdly, I am an optimist, uh, which is why I, I wrote this book. Uh, and you I, sounded just like Rebecca of Sunnybrook Farm so far, yeah, so I'm looking I, forward to hearing. Well, maybe it's because I'm an immigrant's daughter, but I think, uh, first of all, I think there's a huge amount of work to be done, and, uh, and I'm hoping that the 2016 election was a kind of wake-up call for all sides, right? I mean, many people were completely shocked. Um, I, I think a lot of People feel that there were mistakes made on all sides. Um, but to answer your question, the, what, what I describe in the book um, is that the United States, America, was so imperfect. We've repeatedly lived, failed to live up to our ideals. But we have something incredibly special that is extremely rare. Alone among the major powers of the world, we are what I call a supergroup. Let me explain. A supergroup, it's very simple. A supergroup, um, let's take countries, has, you just have to satisfy two requirements to be the supergroup, a supergroup. First, you have to have a very strong overarching national identity, like Americans. And secondly, you have to allow individual subgroup identities to flourish. Uh, to, uh, um, so that you can be, you know, I'm a Croatian American, I'm a Libyan American, I'm a Korean American, and yet be intensely patriotic at the same time. Now, that may seem 
you know, normal to us. But even if you take a country like France, it is not a supergroup. It has the first requirement met, but not the second. France has a very strong, overarching French identity. It's really mandated. They have this concept of laïcité. But they don't let individual subgroup uh, uh, identities flourish in the same way we do. I'm sure you follow the, um, the, the, the veil, headscarves, band, the burkini band that was the full body swimsuit uh, that was banned. And the, the, the president a couple years back said, to be a French person, you must eat like a French person, speak like a French person, um, uh, you know, talk like a French person. So it's a very strong cultural um, superimposition. And uh, many people are, are thinking that that is what has led to the alienation and, and radicalization of many of these um, North African and Muslim communities. So, so we, at our best, are, are a super group. Um, and I, I think that those two requirements are under attack right now. The strong overarching national identity and allowing these individual subgroup uh, identities to flourish. And I think that attack is coming from both sides of the political spectrum. Well then, here's, it uh, seems like an implication of what you're saying is that a solution is, it may not be a word uh, you hear a lot in Seattle, but uh, it would be emphasizing the tribe that is America, which could be, you could call it patriotism, you could call that nationalism. Yes, um, so I, um, again, for a lot of us cosmopolitans types, um, the rah-rah, flag-waving, patriotic, we have a little bit of, I mean, many people have a bit of an aversion to that. The idea is we should be not prioritizing just the United States, we should be thinking about the world. But that doesn't mean that you can't still have a strong collective identity. So here's, so on, on the progressive side, um, I think that um, there has correctly been an attempt to say, we need to correct the history books, right? For a long time, it was like there are these perfect founding fathers, they built this perfect nation, we're a city on a hill, leaving out the fact that there was you know, genocide of certain groups, that m basically most of the country was not allowed to vote. <laughs> they were you know, enslaved, women, group. It's so, so we have rewritten the history books, and, and I think that's all to the good, but I think that we must not go too far. I think it's important to still say... Not go look, too far in correcting the history books? No, to correct them, but to leave the fact that we made these mistakes and that we have a very imperfect history. We have repeatedly failed our own ideals. But we have a noble constitution, even if the founders that wrote it were very flawed. We, have, uh, we are a country that has transcendent ideals. Um, and that we should, we are imperfect, but we should keep aspiring for this. Um, and that we have something special. And so, so, and I think sometimes, you know, I, I, when I see, um, to me, there's a huge difference between saying we have shamefully, we have stains on our history, we have shamefully failed to live up to our own ideals. There's a huge difference between saying that and saying that all of our ideals are lies. That this is a country of oppression that we are built on the principle of white supremacy. But that distinction keeps getting lost. The Seahawks' Michael Bennett was just one example of a person who was sitting during the national anthem and saying to anyone who would listen that I'm sitting because I, 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 we are not living up to our ideals and I'm not shaming America and I'm not anti-America. And I, I don't know, it's hard to tell from Seattle. It's hard to tell. It didn't seem like... Like, I America in general knew what he was talking well, about. Well, I love, see, I, I embrace that. So this is, this is why I say, and some fr from the right, the conservatives, they think, okay, we're the ones that are, is at least, maybe we do some stuff wrong, but we're the national unity people. And my response there is, like, having a strong, overarching American identity that people will buy into isn't just a matter of singing the anthem very loudly and critiquing the other side, right? If you want an identity, a national identity that, that all groups will say, will, will buy into as, of America as a great country, you need to be a society that seems legitimate to, to people. You, you must be a, a society that um, makes marginalized groups feel that they are accorded the same dignity and respect that the dominant group is. So it's not just saying, oh, get up and 
salute the flag, you know. So I, I think enormous work needs to be done. And in this moment where people, I'm not even sure people really want to, want to come together. But my only point, Bill, is that I, we have the apparatus. Yeah. More than other countries. We, we, it's built into our constitution. Um, and it, it's, it's, it's just a matter of almost wanting to come together. I'm not sure people want to come together. I, uh. I, was, I think we've all been um, in a, an argument with a, with a significant other or a child or a friend you know, where you say, you're, you're furious, and you say, look, I'm really trying to understand, you know, I, I'm really trying here. But you know deep in your heart that you're not. Yeah. You know, that you're still mad, and you're, you're, that you're actually just, you know, and we all have been there. If you reach deep in yourself when you know that you're just still mad, and I think, I'm, I mean, I'm speaking personally, I think a lot of Americans are still very mad. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, I mean, there's gonna have to be a, a collective will, to want to try to get to know some people on the other side, and there's going to, we need some courageous leaders, because going to your question, it is these elections coming up, right? It's gonna be what generates, what, what do you think people think will turn out votes? Yeah. And that could either be a race to the bottom or the race to the top. Um, I'm wondering if you have an example of a country, you mentioned France and uh, Venezuela, if there's an example of a, a country or a leader that you think has done a particularly good job of overcoming these sorts of issues in the past. Thank you. Uh, this is gonna be frightening for you. I, I think United States is the best example. Uh, no, I, I, I it, it, it's, it's, people look to us. I mean, I'm doing interviews with Australia and Canada. It's so interesting, people look to us and, um, and I, I know that we're in a moment where we just think, oh my God, you know, um, but definitely not Venezuela. Um, uh, yeah, uh, not uh, Canada? Uh, yeah, That's well, some people's example up here. I know, I, I, think, I, I know, I think Canada is, is, a, is another close um, possible example of, of a super group. Um, there's the fascinating place of Quebec in that. Uh, because uh, remember, the requirement is a very strong, overarching national identity, um, and I think Canadians like to think of themselves as mosaics. So when I talk to Canadians, they 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 go back and forth, you know. And by the way, I'm I I'm not saying that being a supergroup is the best thing in the world. It's just a model that I I think is a good way of negotiating diversity. So China is absolutely not a supergroup by my definition. It's a huge power. But it has the first requirement, an incredibly strong ethnic overarching top-down national identity. Han Chinese, 95% of the population. But you can see that it doesn't let individual smaller minorities flourish, the Uyghurs, the Tibetans. Um, Canada might not almost be, a lot of people say that maybe it's almost, um, what is the connective national identity? A lot of people say it is the multiculturalism. So, so I think that would be a fun debate to have. Um, but I, I, yeah, so it, it's a weird answer. I think, that the, I think that we have the formula for it and that um, I said I was an optimist. I mean, I, yes, I, 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 think, uh, I think it's gonna be a rocky period, but that, that um, I, I see better things ahead. Jason, can you get a question from this side? Meanwhile, I wanna ask you, because um, I'm gonna push against your optimism, <laughs> that aren't you also, in a way, making a, an argument for, if tribalism is that powerful, that this is the argument that separatists make. We are tribal, we should be, we should segregate. I, I actually think a lot of people want to segregate right now in America, both the right and the left. And I'm really afraid of this. And again, the reason, we're not talking about the other half of the book, but I, I think it's interesting to see the United States through the lens of other countries. Because right now, we are just so locked in our own conflict with the people who voted on the other side. Um, uh, and by the way, once you find yourself sort of demonizing or having a very negative view about, say, 60 million people, that's just a lot of people. Uh, and, you know, a lot of people who, who you haven't met. And that if you look at the definition, a definition of a stereotype of a prejudice, it is assigning characteristics to a, a, you know, a faceless group. So, separate, I'm completely against uh, separatism and just because I've seen countries do it. Um, they, they and, and they really split up, you know, and you know what, they are not, uh, you know, look what happened in the former Yugoslavia. 
I mean, the impulse to split up is, um, it, you know, Singapore apparently was quite successful. That was a secessionist movement. Um, so there are some cases, but I just think it would be tragic for the United States to split up. I mean, I, well, I really... Well, it would be violent, you know, you couldn't possibly... Yes, you know. well, yeah, it's, it would be just tragic, I think. Um, Jason, where are you? Where's that question? Yes, hi. Hi. So Van Jones um, says that, the way he puts it is that America's founding ideals were incredible and our founding reality not so much yeah. because those ideals actually applied just to white men of European descent and, and that the arc of our history has been an arc of fighting for full personhood for others to be included in that circle of ideals. Would you agree with that? Very much so. Very much so. Sounds like you read her book. It, yeah. Um, but, but, I mean, even if you, uh, I don't know if you guys saw Hamilton. Um, I find that an incredibly um, good example of my idea of a supergroup, right? Because um, I don't know if people realize exactly how patriotic that play is. Um, you know, on the one hand, it's by using an all-minority cast. It's so powerful. It's, it's taking people who were never allowed to occupy center stage and, 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 um, and putting them on center stage. But if you go back and watch the play, it is not cynical. You know, it is not what a lot of college campuses say that this is a land. It is just absolutely all about those ideals. So it's kind of like saying what you said, that yes, boy, were our founders as people imperfect. And boy, is there a lot of whitewashed, erased history that we're not talking about, that we need to expose. But that the values and, and, and vision in the, that the, uh, in the founding documents is one that should transcend groups and that can be owned by even people of, of minorities. I should say that another um, dynamic, because I didn't get to this half, there's all these, I find pe it's very confusing because people just sling terms around, you know, white supremacy and, and this, and it's just not very helpful in understanding the situation. Um, in addition to the massive demographic change uh, that has caused every group to feel threatened, there's something else that has happened in America. Um, and it has to do, it's basically that class and almost an educational divide has split America's white majority. Um, and because I've studied um, uh, ethnic groups for so long, the division between more coastal, urban, um, uh, 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 you know, people in New York, uh, those whites and whites in the middle of the country is so, that difference is so big now, it's almost like an ethnic difference. There is so much more intermarriage, I mean the numbers are interesting, I think you'll find them interesting, between uh, Caucasians on, in cities, you know, Caucasians in New York or San Francisco are much more likely to marry somebody from South Asia or China or the Middle East or whatever than they are from somebody from the heartland. Uh, and, 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 and partly that is because of cultural differences. Oh my God, what is your view? Oh my God, you voted for whom? You know, and, and even the way people dress and talk. So I think that a huge problem is the decline in social mobility and geographical mobility. This is a, I, in one of my pieces I say this should be viewed as a national emergency. Because in America, historically, you could be from the middle of the country going to just a fr cheap, free public school, you could go to state college, make it pr be pretty successful, go to the coast, start something, come back, and there was a lot of fluidity. Now, it is so expensive to live in the coasts. I was just learning about Seattle. Um, uh, you know, I mean, it is, it, it, is, it is so expensive even for pretty privileged people to send their kids to a top college tuition, these tutors, all this stuff. How can somebody from a working class family that never even heard of these standardized tests, how could they possibly compete? How can they possibly get to these uh, places? And they can't afford rent. You, you, you can't afford, you can't go to San Francisco. And, so I, I, I do see, again, post-election, when you ask me about optimism, there are a lot, very fast, America has huge correctional devices, I think, um, even my own colleagues trying to address uh, fiscal and tax and urban policy. How can we make it so that people actually can afford to move and live? Um, how can we pr bring startup stuff so that it's not only in places like Silicon Valley and Seattle, but like in the middle of the country? So 
So I think once, again, once you diagnose the problem, like how did we get to this point of deep division, you, you can start to redress it. How, is there a way to expose the fact that America doesn't always live up to its ideals in a way that doesn't make the majority dangerously defensive? It, it's hard. I mean, I, I, I think um, uh, this is a scary line, but I, I write about our mistakes in Afghanistan. Um, by the way, part of my thesis is that America has tended to be very um, blind to the group identities that matter most to people on the ground uh, in countries where we intervene. So we went to Iraq, we just, Sunni, Shias, Kurds, ah, let's just have an election. Uh, you know, it just doesn't work that way. Um, they, we imagine democracy will melt away group divisions. Anyway, in Afghanistan, uh, you may not know this, but we, we, had our, we, we tend to have these ideological blinders. Um, we're, we're fighting for capitalism, or we're, we're democracy, um, and we don't pay attention to these tribal identities or group identities. In Afghanistan, the Taliban, U.S. just thought, okay, Isla Islamists. But I'm, I bet many of you don't know that the Taliban is also an ethnic movement. Um, in that country, there are 14 ethnic groups mentioned in Afghanistan's national anthem. And the largest three are the Pashtuns, the Uzbeks, and the Tajiks. And the Pashtuns are like the whites in America. They founded the country, they were dominant for 300 years, all their rulers, but they started to lose their dominance, fear of losing their dominance in the Cold War and afterwards. And we missed this fact. When we, when we intervened, we allied ourselves with the other groups. Oops, <laughs> you know, they, they, they viewed the United States as threatening them and we just did everything wrong. But coming back to the United States and your question, a line I have is that for me, looking at countries across the world, one scary axiom of group behavior I see is that once dominant, dominant groups cede their power very reluctantly. Um, so you're asking a good question. We're going to have to rise and be our better angels. Um, we were tested once before. Whites have never been um, a minority at the national level but they were a minority in some of the southern states after the Emancipation Proclamation. After the Civil War, when um, African Americans were suddenly given the vote and, and enfranchised, whites found themselves suddenly terrified. Oh my gosh, they were suddenly a minority of the voting population in about seven states. How did they respond? Jim Crow. Jim Crow. It, we, that was... That, that was a, a big stain on our history. We did not rise to the occasion. We responded more like South Africa did. Disenfranchisement, Jim Crow. So we have some lessons to learn, which is why, you know, again, if you present things as part of historical patterns, you see the dangers. And I think if you see the dangers um, uh, in a larger scale and you realize what's at stake, then maybe we can get out of this thing we're in now, which is just like it's all the other side, really, um, which is completely not productive for overcoming you know, anything, actually. Hey, uh, I guess I'm the alley in the room, a uh, recent veteran in the US, U.S. Army, um, libertarian, Trump voter, sorry, folks. Uh, question for you. Uh, so we see, I think we see the rise of the alt-right and, like, the, the reason um, they're getting more airplay because the grie moderate grievances, working-class whites and whites in general, aren't being addressed. So how would you integrate those grievances in terms of demographic change and the uh, inability of the white working class to uh, uh, find representation in the nation right now while trying to establish this med new meta-identity? Great, I, I'm not sure I heard the whole thing, but I, um, you know, so in the book I pull no punches. Um, I think it was um, uh, uh, not the right call. So this initial thing of check your, white privilege thing made sense, which is like, look, I'm an Asian woman, I've, I've experienced it, I've had so many, you know, people try to speak for me, so I, it resonates for me. But the, if you understand the tribal instinct, everybody wants to feel that they belong to a pro tribe that they can be proud of. It's human nature. So if you keep saying you belong to a tribe that is horrible, you know, you, you are, there's nothing good about your tribe. You know, white people are the cancer of the country, that you did nothing but oppress people. Um, 
that from a tribal, I'm not saying right or wrong, but from a human nature tribal perspective, uh, it is not surprising that when there were smaller groups saying, you know what, you're not so bad. And then, you know what, actually, your people founded the country. And then increasingly, you know what, you, you know, why did they keep saying? So I... This is what I mean by defensiveness, though. Someone says, notice your privilege. Check your privilege. And that becomes, oh, my God, you're saying that I, I'm the, the worst in the world. That's in, a huge stretch. What but, about just notice the difference in how different people get to go through the world. Yes, but I, I, I think that we all need to do more listening. I'm not saying this is easy, right? Because the problem is you often have dominant voices that are just too loud. So you do need to, you know, shut up for a while or something, <laughs> you know. Uh, but, but on the other hand, this kind of, I, I'm, I'll show my cards. I'm a very big free speech person. You know, I think that, um, for example, um, I'm a huge fan of immigration. I'm the daughter of two immigrants. I, my second book was about how immigration is the lifeblood of this country. And yet I feel that it makes sense to me that many Americans living um, who haven't had a lot of interactions with Asians or African Americans or Muslims are anxious. They're seeing their country change. They see the Oscars and the Grammys and things are different and they can't even talk the way they used to talk. They're always being called out. No, that's, you know. I think that people should be able to express their anxieties about immigration and actually ask about the rules. Like, how do we decide who gets to come in? What, you know, what can we, without instantly being labeled a racist xenophobe, which is how it is a lot on, you know, again, where I'm, you know, I'm in a very, I come from a very progressive setting. If it's almost like a tribal signal. There are just two tribes. And if you are starting to say, well, with immigration, are you sure? Like, un oh, wrong tribe, racist xenophobe. You know? And the, the problem with that is that if you don't allow people to express these anxieties, and I think that you're, it's, to me, it's natural that you would have these anxieties if you're seeing your country change um, without being a racist. You know, and if you don't let people express these and try to persuade them and talk and argue, it will go underground. And to respond to the, the person's question, it's the stuff underground that most terrifies me. That that is, because when you're underground, you're in your echo chamber, there is no check, and you hear the ugliest voices, the ugliest things. You should see what comes at me on email and Twitter. It's just, you know, you could it could make you discouraged about the whole project. Um, but Maybe so I'm I, not yeah. on social media enough, but I, I, I hear that, that you, know, you can't talk, express worry about uh, immigration and demographic change without being called a racist. And um, I think, where is that happening? You know, who, who's calling someone a horrible racist every time they, they, they say, I, I get it. I hear people opposing, um, you know, saying, no, we should, um, you know, we, we should... Uh, they, they don't feel the same way about the DACAs or the, the Dreamers or something. But I, where is that person being shouted down and having things thrown at it? Maybe on social media, maybe no, in the I, comment section. I don't know. I mean, I again, maybe I'm just from Yale, which is a uh -huh. very progressive um, place. But, um, you know, it used to be that the right and the left had more of a overlap on issues of undocumented. You know, the term used to be illegal, uh, yeah, um, right. but now it's undocumented. Um, but now it's, it's um, I don't, uh, I, I have seen a change in the rhetoric. And again, this is not just me seeing it. The Pew study have, have shown that the views on immigration have moved more extreme on both sides. Yeah. With more people saying, no, we don't want any of them. Shut it down, build the wall or whatever. And other people almost saying, not maybe not necessarily open borders, but like, it's good to have more people from these countries come in. Then maybe there'll be, few. let's get the browning of America faster right. kind of thing. You know? so, I, I, so you're, maybe I'm just on a college campus and uh. hearing it more, but, but I, I, I think a lot of conversations that, are, that need to be had are, are, are stuck, even on gun control. Mm -hmm. You know, it's sort of the language immediately goes to you, you like children being killed. You're a murderer. You're a terrorist. And once you're labeling the other side, things like that, it's just very hard to, to make progress. Well, maybe I'm the optimist here. That's, <laughs> I, that seems like I know that there's people who yell those things, but I saw different states have debates, and Washington, yes, on the bump stock ban, and 
No one 21 years old to buy a weapon for now, maybe later in Florida pass some of those restrictions. Interesting. So now I'm maybe Seattle. I mean, you have a different, you know, every place where I speak, you, there are different demographic um, issues and strains, yeah. right? So you may not have a very large, you know, like I just came from California that has a very large um, Latino population. Um, and it, I think California is already a majority minority uh, state. So, so the discussions are very different. Yeah. Um, and here, I assume you have a, probably a very large Asian population. Yeah. So the, the tri forms of tribalism and us versus them may take a different form. It may not be what I'm talking about. But, but you know, we are seeing all over the country a sense of kind of zero-sum political tribalism, a feeling that there's not enough for everybody, that, you know, spots and spoils and, and uh, are being um, competed for, and there's not enough to, to go around. I saw this hand up. Uh, yeah, he's about to stand. To a very intolerant attitude once I start to express my views. It's very clear. And if you want an example of Seattle self-righteous epitome of, um, of, of, of forbidding those sorts of, exp expressing those views, yeah. it's the stranger. It's the what? The, it's a, the magazine called The Stranger. It's, okay. it's, it's, a, it's a liberal publication. Yes, it's very so, popular and it's yes. excellent. I read it every week. Yeah, but are they shutting it, you but down? The attitude of that is very intolerant towards okay. any of those ideas. So, so I'm just I'm hearing an a lot of applause. This is my curiosity. Do you feel shut down when something that's, in, that's on a website or in a newspaper is, is an opinion that you don't share? I, I, I don't get how that's turned it's into. It's social shunning. It's, Social it's, it's being ostracized, socially shunned, ashamed, and feeling unwelcome. I just want to express for you, I'm, I'm actually very moderate in most places, yeah. but you don't understand how, how, how shunning works. Social shunning works in ostracizing. No, I don't know how a publication shuns somebody. Well, re, the, like no, it's attitude. It's attitude is very intolerant, very self-righteous, yeah. very indignant. It's very moralistic. Yeah. Oh, it's... it's I, I can't, if you don't see it, I can't help you, but it's very clear. I hear clear. it all the time. You know, it's, it's, there's no question about it. I hear it. Yeah. Going back to the idea, you'd spoken of legitimacy. Um, do you think that our court and legal system can be an effective check against the ill effects of tribalism, or do you think it just exacerbates the problem? So how would the legal system, maybe an example, how, how are you thinking of the legal system maybe being a tool? Um, so like the idea of mandatory minimums and how it kind of just reflects our... The, the idea, I keep missing these, the, the term, oh. the, manage, the, the, um... Mandatory minimums? Sentencing. Sentencing, oh, I see. Um, oh, sentencing, yes, yeah. minimum sentences. Uh, okay, so, so I think I'll try to answer your question um, broadly. I, more optimism from me. I have been so proud of many of my students. Um, things that I think that would not be controversial, right? Just trying to uphold the rule of law. Some things are political, of course. We'll have differences on which lawsuits are uh, being brought. But um, I think that uh, enormous good in trying to make the system more legitimate for everybody can be done through the judiciary, through trying to bring lawsuits. Um, and again, we'll, diff we'll, we'll all be on different sides of these things. Um, so I'm not sure I'm answering the question very well, but I am from a law school and a big believer that uh, back to the question about who has a better system. I mean, we really have a good legal system. It's not perfect. That's what we're working on. But we have, the, I keep going back to the term, we have the apparatus. We haven't always used it. Yeah. In fact, we largely often don't use it well, but we have, we have the apparatus. Thank you so much for being here. Um, in the beginning, you talked about how we have a natural bent towards, everybody has a natural bent towards tribalism. And so, giving the example of the kids, you know, one was part of the red group, one was, and even in their, maybe not having a complete self-awareness, they gravitated towards the tribalism. And then what happens is that the, everything they perceive is through the, yes. the filter of the tribe to which they belong. So, that's what we do. And two people can be sitting in a venue like this, and we're going to perceive, we're going to hear the things that you say the way, you know, through our filters. So how do we, and I haven't had the opportunity to read your book yet, maybe you address this in there, yes. but how do we get to the point 
you were talking about we have the apparatus, but how do we get to the point where people are open enough to 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 yeah. come to to be able to say, I want to understand how why you feel this way, and and. I'm How so do we get yeah. away from yeah. feeling the threat so we can come to some kind of compromise? Yeah, that's a great question. I am so glad you asked that. Um, so I, instead of all the depressing studies, I, there are some incredibly exhilarating studies. Um, so um, overwhelmingly, studies show that if you can pull people out of their tribal context and have them interact as human beings, it's stunning. how fast progress can be made. And to be very clear, I'm not just talking about exposure. Um, there are tons of studies that show that if you, that diversity can lead to more group conflicts. If you just put a bunch of people from different, you know, backgrounds together in a room, they could end up hating each other more. The, the, but the, the studies specifically show that is, if, so if you take a, a Trump voter and an anti-Trump person and put them in a room and say, don't talk about politics, but talk about dogs, your pets, or your children, or, or sports team, or how you like your pizza, whatever, people quickly find common ground. And so there are, um, the, the integration of the military in the 50s is an example that I talk about that is really inspiring. So it's hard to imagine, but in the 50s, um, people were completely opposed to this. We can't integrate the military, you know, people, it will, we won't have an effective military anymore. Well, after they did, um, they did a study and they found that the integrated units were as effective or better than the all-white units. And when they interviewed people, it was astonishing. And it wasn't just black and white. I mean, this was a time when Polish Americans had never interacted with Italian Americans or Mexican Americans. And what they said is when you have to sleep in the same quarters, be exposed to the same dangers, you know, eat, talk, um, suffer the same things, and have your life in the hands of somebody else, you don't care what their skin color is. You don't care what their accent is. And that, there are some really heartening stories. Same uh, with attitudes towards same-sex marriage. Um, 30 years ago, 90% of Americans were opposed to it. Um, and so now a very large majority is in favor. Why? Studies show that it, when it was a faceless group, these people, it was easy to demonize them. But once people realized, oh my gosh, it's my cousin. It's this, the, this applies to my neighbor, my friend, my colleague, my daughter. The views change very, very quickly. So I, um, Sona, Sona Mayor has an inspiring interview from yesterday. She said exactly this. Uh, you know, she says, in this time of maximum polarization, everyone's in distress, you need to, the, the, the best thing to do is to force yourself to listen. And it's actually very hard to do. Um, so I, going around the country, I have learned about all these amazing initiatives that I never heard of. So I, I think a lot of the, the hate being generated is because it's social media and you get the highest ratings and the most clicks and the most retweets if it's something incredibly inflammatory, you know, and taking down the enemy. Um, and so that's what we see all the time. But I, my own view is, uh, talking to a lot of Americans everywhere, is that people are weary of it. They're, they're, they're uh, tired of it, you know. Um, and it's exhausting just to feel so much. And so there, I just learned of this group, Better Angels. I just had this t t group of high school students with half of them pro-Trump, half of them anti-Trump, have this program, 19 states. I mean, so I, you know, I'm, I've been learning all these things. Some, an artist showed me. Anyway, so I, I think that there are quiet initiatives, and they're not the loudest voices. That's the problem. Social media and what you hear are the loudest voices. Um, but that, that's my, my thought, that um, to, to, we need to regain this sense of that we're all fellow Americans, even as we're very different. And the only way to do that is really to find different ways to engage as, as human beings. Is there something you do, Amy, to get over your own tribalism? Yeah, your I, filters, your defensiveness, your whatever. You know, I I got in such trouble with the tiger mom thing. I think I've always been an outsider. Does everyone know battle yeah, yeah, the tiger yeah. mother? Okay. And it's weird. I'm somebody that has just always never fit in quite well anywhere. You know, when I go to, I, I, I'm, I'm Chinese. My first language was Chinese, but I was born here. When I go to China, they all, you know, I mean, I, I don't fit in there here. You know, I never, um, so I 
I'm always this weird creature. In fact, I'm, tr my, I'm very close to my family. But in my classes, I really um, am well known for having, um, I, I take this as a big compliment, people know that I teach um, the most diverse class at Yale Law School. And I don't mean diverse just in terms of minorities. This is a very important point because there are people self-select. There'll be classes and everybody's taking critical race theory. They're all the same political views. And then you have the Federalist Society is all in this originalism class, you know, and it's, um, and in my class, which admittedly has the great topic, very neutral, it's called international business transactions, right? So it's not about abortion, yeah. Um, but I do use it to talk about, I used it to talk about democracy and ethnic conflict. I mean, I use it to talk about stuff I, I write about. I always, every year, have a very large minority representation. Last year I had 16 African Americans, 16 Asian Americans, 16, uh, nine Muslim students, but I also had a very large conservative showing. I had 16 members of the Federalist Society, which is our conservative student group. And what I try to do is I, on certain topics, I say, here are the ground rules. And, and, and again, it's not the most, I don't go to, with the most charged topics, because some of those I, you know, but it's something that's a little bit provocative. Um, and I say, here are the ground rules. We're going to assume benefit of the doubt. Even if people misuse a word, they, unless it's terrible, obviously. But in general, if people are framing things in a way that isn't how you'd frame it, listen it at, to it. Um, and, you know, um, and, you know, I think I, I had this amazing story. Um, it, this is kind of stark. Um, we, we're always working on getting more diversity. But, you know, we're, we're doing much better with women and minorities right now. But when we, uh, you know, J.D. Vance, The Hillbilly Elegy, was my student. I'm in that book. He wrote that book as originally as a paper for me. Um, and you strongly encouraged him yes, to write Yes, that I have a whole book. story about that. For I can tell people. Yeah. But, um, and he and I are very close. But we, uh, later we started to focus on class diversity. And we, in, in the class that's going to graduate next year, there was only one uh, person who would count as a lower income white person. One out of a class of 199. So, you know, there are multiple forms of diversity that, um, uh, but, but, but I, we were talking about um, guns and, 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 you know, a student uh, in a very, very diverse class of mostly urbanites, very much on the other side, talked about how his family hunted, um, very poor family actually for, for, for dinner, you know, um, and I, it's not a kumbaya story. This is not that then they fell into each other's arms and became changed, exchanged views. Largely, people still kept their own views um, and still disagreed, but people could have a beer afterwards and argue and talk. And as a, as a, so it's, it's baby steps, you know, baby steps. Um, I will say that after the last election, it got it was much tenser. The, the last time I taught this, it, it was much more charged, and I'm hoping that was just right after the election. Uh, and that we'll go back, but um, but I think if you, uh, it goes back to the fact that humans are tribal by default, but unlike other primates, we can overcome our tribalism, uh, you know, uh, with structure, with laws, with 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 civic training, with inspiring leaders, um, you know, there, there's plenty of evidence of it. Does anyone? It's it's time, right? Does anyone? I'm wondering if anyone here has a story to share of overcoming their own tribalism. Right? Something you're going to come out of here, you're going to do differently, or you want to you inspire the rest of us to come out of this church and do differently. I saw, the, I saw this hand first. African American in the middle. Hi. Uh, I do have a story that I thought was very important for this conversation. There was a question of what does social ostracism uh, look like in Seattle. It's not exactly uh, what you were looking for here. Um, but I wanted to share... Uh, uh, why I'm here tonight. Actually, I went out searching for this book because the, the interactions that I was having at, at work felt so wrong and so strange. Um, I work in an educational institution, and I recently uh, had a new job, and we had uh, book groups as part of our professional development. I signed up for a, a book group uh, reading ta Coates. I was interested. Um, I thought it would be challenging. Uh, so I went to this book group, and we were, there were mostly white folks at the book group, and I assumed that we would read this challenging work, talk about the ideas, struggle, argue about things. Um, I found some things initially that I wasn't comfortable with that I, that I disagreed with the perspective. 
Um, I assumed that I would share that, share my, my uncertainties, and that the group would kind of respond and we'd talk about that. I found it really interesting that as I was sharing this, that uh, we went around and shared, I, I was interrupted by someone, and, um, and I, was, I noticed that, right? And as we continued to talk, I was continually interrupted by this person. And I asked, can I, you know, can I please express my views? I understand your views are different. And I, I, I was shouted down. I was shouted down that this is this person's lived experience. And so I, and I found after a couple of sessions with this book group that uh, we weren't all there for the same reason. I, I was there to struggle and, and consider these ideas, not assume necessarily that they were the, like, the truth, you know, the, the only way to view things. Yeah. And I felt, and everyone else, I, no, one, no one defended me. No one else came to my rescue. Everyone else at the book group was there because um, they wanted that perspective. That was the perspective on race. That was the, the okay. approved perspective on race. Thank you for the story. Not the inspiring one I'd hoped for, yeah. but do you have any final words well, to leave us with, Well, I think there's Amy? a man here in the middle yeah, that who might... Oh, hey, okay, so round two. Uh, I want to thank you for mentioning the military integration thing. Um, my best friend in the military, a uh, guy named Drew Hakali, he's also my roommate back in the barracks, um, South Korean fellow, dude from Long Island. He had joked that I was the first black person he had talked to in 10 years, uh, so just listen. So I, I like how that um, um, qualified institutions like the military, STEM, um, tech sector in Seattle are able to bring folks together uh, despite the demographic differences. So thank you for integrating that into your uh, discussion. Yes, you are, you are an optimist. I, I, we, we've kind of laid out some dangers and some hopeful signs. Any final words for us, Amy Chua? Um, no, I, 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 um, I, uh, I, I think that um, just the way that I have s studied so many different other countries, um, it's actually encouraging. You know, you should, you should look at some other countries and realize um, that it may just feel abysmal and so dark and divided, but, but compared to a lot of other countries, we, we, we do have more tying us together. Um, uh, so, so anyway, thank you all for coming, and uh, I thought this was a great discussion, actually. I'm okay. glad. <laughs> Your book will be right out here, right okay. outside.